it's Cara O'Reilly, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show, episode 12, with our very special guest, Dan Hughes from Google Nick. Boy, are we we're going to learn some fun stuff on HDR today. So I'm going to start with uh, introducing our friends from the Landscape Photography theme page and they'll tell you a little bit about themselves. I'm Cara Riley and I am a small business and real estate consultant and a curator for the landscape photography theme. Also bridges around the world and everything red. So we have a lot of fun and tonight we have a new curator to our show, Kevin Rowe. Kevin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hello. Um, so I live in South Jordan, Utah, which is in the Salt Lake City Valley, and I am a mortgage lender, and uh, that's my main job, I guess, and my, my hobby, and uh, I do sell some of my photography, and uh, it's good to be here. Oh, Kevin, thanks for joining us. And now we're going to go to Jim Worthman from the Phoenix area. Jim? Thanks, Cara. Yeah, I uh, by day uh, am an engineering manager, and uh, my I guess passion really is uh, as an amateur enthusiast landscape photographer. I like color and black and white. Um, based in Phoenix, like Cara said, so a lot of gorgeous Southwest landscapes are are uh, nearby to shoot. Um, I am a curator on the landscape photography theme and I help moderate the landscape photography community. And uh, you can see my other website down in my uh, title bar. Thanks, Jim. And I'm gonna introduce our special guest tonight, uh, Dan Hughes, who is the trainer for the Google Nick uh, software programs and uh, Dan was one of our guests before and we are so delighted to have him come back we are going to be talking about the HDR e Pro 2 so Dan we'll let you take it away <laughs> very good thanks Cara You're so uh, we're going to be getting into HDR FX Pro 2 tonight um, I uh, will ask you guys to stop me whenever you have any questions or, or uh, feel as though me to, uh, I don't know, stop or slow down or just mention anything. Uh, now, I'm going to switch into our screen share, and we're going to start with um, basically just an intro into how to open HDRFX Pro 2, and then how to use the uh, um, the ghost reduction tools, the initial capabilities of, uh, of merging the images together. And then from there, we'll take a look at uh, actually adjusting some landscape images inside of HDRFX Pro 2. Um, so yeah, I'll jump right in, and uh, you know I'll mention some other things as we go, uh, because like Cara said, uh, I do the online training and the education for Nick Software um, here at Google. Yeah. Uh, now, oh, go ahead, Jim. Just just a quick one. Uh, in case people haven't seen it, yesterday uh, we shared one of your tutorial videos on the Landscape Photography Show stream that gives just an outstanding overview of HDR. And I don't know that you're going to go into all that detail tonight, but I'd encourage anyone who hasn't seen it to, to go take a look. And, and there are a bunch of other tutorials up, but that one in particular is a great overview. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's a, a good point as well. Um, we, we won't necessarily be getting into sort of how to shoot HDR um, or, you know, the basic gear or anything, the stuff that that's covered in the, uh, the demonstration that Jim's talking about. We're going to just strictly take a look at HDR FX Pro 2. Uh, otherwise, I'd be keeping here for three or four hours, you know, explaining everything. Uh, now, I have a couple other links that I can share with you later on that uh, um, will help to, you know, I guess learn more about HDR as well as Nick Software and uh, uh, like different things that you can do to your raw images before you merge your images and stuff like that into an HDR. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna start with an exposure series actually from Lightroom. I'll make sure I've got it all ready. So I'll go with my desktop. And the um the great thing is that we will put all of the links that um, 
uh, Dan is talking about on our summary. So you will have links to all of the, the video that um, Jim was making reference to and also anything that um, Dan has made reference to. You will have those links on our summary that will be posted tomorrow morning. Cool. Thanks, Cara. Now, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. We, I just it, it's palm trees and uh, building. Yep. So, so this is our first exposure series, and uh, it's it's not exactly the most picturesque landscape, but I like to start with it just because there's a, a major problem that we run into when shooting HDR exposure series, and that is people and things move while you're shooting the exposure series. Uh, you can see, you know, actually this gentleman right here. He's moving. You know, there's a couple other people that are kind of walking around in the exposure series. Uh, that creates ghost artifacts, or I should say it can create ghost artifacts, and uh, these, these artifacts are, are generally unappealing. Sometimes they look kind of cool, but most of the time you just want to get rid of them. Uh, HDR FX Pro 2 has a really fantastic tool. It's very easy to use uh, that, that will allow us to control those artifacts. So uh, the first thing we've got to do is open our exposure series into HDRFX Pro 2. Uh, to do that, as a Lightroom or an Aperture user, you'll go into your library. You'll click on either the right-hand side or the left-hand side image within your exposure series. Hold the shift series. This is simply going to enable your images. Um, and then you can right-click, go to Export, and then click on HDRFX Pro 2. Uh, now, as I click on that, um, accessing from Aperture is a little bit different. You'd highlight those images, you'd um, right-click, and then you'd go to a dialog that says, um, shoot, what does it say? It says, <laughs> um, uh, edit with plugin, I believe, is the, is the dialog. And then you'll see HDR Effects Pro 2 show up in there. Uh, we're going to launch HDR from Photoshop later on as well, so you can see sort of the difference in how to launch the software. What's really cool is that the interfaces look exactly the same whether you launch from Photoshop or Lightroom or Aperture. So that stuff doesn't matter. You're going to open up into this. Uh, now this is the merge dialog where you're going to have your exposure series up in the top toolbar, a large preview, and exposure value slider down here at the bottom and then your, your different merge tools, so your alignment, your ghost reduction, and your chromatic aberrations. Um, now, is that legible over the head? Can you guys read that text at all? Ooh. It's a bit small. Okay. Yeah, it's so I'll just, small. I'll make sure I point it out here. Okay, we can see the cursor. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so down at the bottom of the large preview, you've got an exposure value slider. And you can slide it left and right, and you can get a good idea as to all of the information that you're going to be merging together. Now, it doesn't actually matter where you leave this slider. When you click the Create HDR button in the lower right-hand corner, um, which is what will bring you into HDR FX Pro 2's interface to adjust the image, uh, this is simply for this view. But it's really handy uh, when you've got ghost artifacts or possibly chromatic aberrations like we have here with the ghost artifacts. Now, I went ahead and clicked on my loop bu uh, button, or the magnifying glass button in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, this opens up the loop function, and you can see the ghosts here, or the ghost artifact, as it's called. Um, this guy is, is not fully formed. He's probably not even sharp on your, uh, um, your, your Google Plus Hangout here, but uh, we want to fix this, right? He, he should only show up once, and he should be fully formed. Uh, same goes for this gentleman over here, where there's two of him. He's got some groceries. He's going to be walking up the stairs. Uh, he's showing up twice. And then this gentleman has his own ghost following him as well. <laughs> so, so this is stuff that we don't want, typically. Right? They're artifacts. Uh, to get rid of them, you basically just click on the ghost reduction checkbox, which, again, it might be hard to see right now, um, but there's a little checkbox that's to the left of your ghost reduction label. If you click on that, it enables the ghost reduction, and usually that'll just take care of any ghost artifacts. Just by clicking on it, it does a really good job. Um, if it doesn't fix everything, 
there are some extra options and they're really pretty important options um, it, they allow you to choose how much sort of reduction you're going to be doing based upon a single exposure uh, and it also allows you to choose which exposure you want to pull the movement from so up in this top toolbar you're seeing a ghost reference image that's on um, this is the exposure that we're currently taking anything that's moving from uh, now uh, Again, this looks pretty good on the things that are moving down here in the, uh, the sort of darker areas in the exposure series. Uh, but I implore you to try one extra thing. Whenever you turn on that ghost reduction checkbox, make sure you go through the full range of information. Uh, now, this one's going to be really hard to see uh, in, in the resolution that you're probably viewing at because I think these Hangouts uh, are streaming at something like 720p. Um, but you've got an artifact here that's going around the uh, uh, the palm tree. It's it's a little bit of a halo. I wish I could zoom in right now, but I really, for some reason, uh, my... So there's a little bit of a halo, and it's occurring because of the ghost reference image, and actually the ghost reduction. Uh, if I just go and click on my two stops overexposed... Uh, if I just go and click on my two stops over I, I think somebody has the, maybe they have the YouTube plane also, needs to get that turned off or, or muted because uh, we hear somebody in the background. I can hear that. There we go. It, it's okay. We, we always learn something new on these Hangouts, so thanks, Dan, for hanging in there with us. <laughs> oh, no problem. It, it is funny how, you know, there's so many variables that uh, uh, oh. that can... Right, if you will. <laughs> well, so, we, all have, we all have our sound studios at home, and so it's, <laughs> it's hard to hard to control them all. Definitely. So, by changing the ghost reference image, you're basically changing which exposure you're pulling the movement from. So, as I click on this two stops overexposed, it'll basically just fix that issue for me. And then you want to make sure that you uh, bring your exposure value up, back up and uh, make sure that your people and anything else that's moving because of those ghost artifacts uh, are still uh, correct, I guess, right, without those kinds of artifacting. <clears throat> now, um, I will mention that if you don't need ghost reduction, make sure that this little checkbox is off. Because if it's on and the software can't find any sort of ghost artifacts, I've, I've seen um, other sort of errors occur because of that. So just make sure you only have it on when you need it. Um, I wouldn't turn it on as a default setting. Now, once you've set up all of your different adjustments on the right-hand side, you're just going to click the Create HDR button. It's in the lower right-hand corner. And that's going to bring you into uh, HDRFX Pro 2's main interface, where you can control that. Now let me just make sure that that echo isn't from me. There we go. Hopefully that's helpful. I don't have a headset on, but usually I don't pick up reverb. So, um, Anyways, we're inside of HDRFX Pro 2 now. And uh, this is the main user interface where you control all of the different adjustments on your image. And I won't spend too much time on this HDR just because it isn't uh, you know, the most picturesque sort of landscape image. It's kind of like a... I, I think it's Cuba. Yeah. And it's... Uh, um, uh, a little more urban, right, obviously. <laughs> so basically, when you start off with HDRFX Pro 2, uh, we would suggest starting with a preset. Uh, now, there are 28 presets that are built into the software. Uh, they range from very realistic looking uh, to uh, much more surreal and stylized sorts of effects. And it's entirely up to you as the artist, as the photographer, uh, to work the image however you might want. Right? We want to offer you the capability to, um, to, to do whatever you like. And the beauty of these presets is that you get this sort of uh, this, this one-click look, and then you can also go into the right-hand side and kind of adjust from there. So let's say you really loved the end-of-the-road preset. Uh, I'm going to go in and just fine-tune and tweak it using the sliders on the right. right? So you're, you're never stuck with what the preset gives you you can always go ahead over to the right-hand side and make adjustments. Uh, the other cool option 
is that you can download recipes and presets and we actually offer a whole set of those for free uh, you can find those on the Nick Photography Google Plus page uh, and then of course you can create your own which is very very nice because you know you might not necessarily want to use the presets that are sort of built in you want to create your own stylized look or your own even realistic look uh, where well, you can do that save it as a preset and then you really don't have to worry about doing any kind of work after that <clears throat> So let's actually take a look at doing that. Let's start with a preset, and then so, move over uh, into the tools Dan, palette. I think that that might be you. Do you have something else open that's kind of giving us the reverb? Uh, let's see here. If you if somehow you got the YouTube channel open, that would do it. Okay. Yeah. If it was streaming via. Yes. Um, I'll check here. I I don't think I do. Okay. Let's, I'll get rid of my extra windows. And that one shouldn't be. Did that work? All right. Well, now now you're not now you're not vibrating, so we're we're good. <laughs> okay. I did. I actually closed my own page, so maybe that was what it was. My apologies. Never know, gremlins. We we just we know they get, they're there. <laughs> All right. Is is my screen still? Uh... There we go. Okay. There... I just want to make sure the interface is still up. Very good. All right. So my apologies for that. We've gone ahead and clicked on a preset on the left-hand side. We then move over into the Tools palette on the right-hand side, uh, where you've got Tone Compression or Tone Mapping Controls, uh, Tonality Controls, and then Color Adjustments. And I don't think we'll be able to go into all of these tools during the demonstration, uh, but we'll definitely get into some of the really important ones. Uh, and then like I said before as well, there's there's tons of content uh, that's recorded uh, that you can find on our YouTube, uh, the Nick Software or the Nick Photography uh, YouTube channel. I'll make sure you guys get those links as well. That's great. So, Thank you, Dan. <laughs> no problem. Uh, these are very important tools in the upper right hand corner. Uh, these are the tone mapping or tone compression capabilities. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about HDR FX Pro 2 and really the main reason why you can create a whole bunch of different kinds of effects uh, is that there's four different tone mapping algorithms as I kinda just click around into these different settings there's four different tone mapping algorithms uh, which you can combine together to create different looks now if you want a very realistic look you might go with um, you know your depth set to normal your detail set to realistic and your drama setting set to deep or natural, right? And these settings are going to give you the most kind of realistic um, looking and, and uh, realistic feel to your HDR image. Uh, but but other than these HDR method tools that you see right here, uh, the two sliders in the upper right hand corner are incredibly important. Uh, this first one, tone compression, allows you as you slide it to the right to lighten the shadows and darken the highlights. Basically, the further to the right you go with this slider, the more the image is going to look like an HDR. The further to the left that you go, the more the image is going to look like a single image exposure. Right? As you can see now, this looks sort of natural as if you were just standing there and took a regular, um, uh, a regular single exposure. And what's really interesting is that even if we leave the tone compression down at negative 100, all of the data all of the information that we captured is still here and it's still kind of in the background. So let's say you wanted a really realistic look. Uh, you might slide your tone compression slider into the negative. You might initially be kind of concerned because your highlights, these brighter tones in the image, will go too bright. But then what you can do is click into your tonality, take your highlight slider to the left, and you're basically just going to darken down any of those really bright values. Right, so now we're getting a more realistic look and feel, but we're still able to uh, utilize all of the information in the uh, in the exposure series. In fact, an interesting or fun trick that I just figured out maybe two or three weeks ago, uh, and this only works on maybe sixty percent of of uh, HDR exposure series. If you bring both the tone compression and the method strength down to the left that is method strength at zero and tone compression at negative 100 um, and then take your 
Rotates slider to the left, then contrast maybe up into the right a little bit. Uh, you're going to get a very realistic looking HDR image, right? At this point, and hopefully you can see all of the data. Um, we have every bit of information in the highlights and the shadows, and yet it still looks realistic. It looks regular. Um, again, it's just a way to get a very sort of realistic view or look at the image. Uh, if we wanted to take it in a more stylized direction, I might take this tone compression slider to the right, bring my method strength up a little bit, uh, and then bring my highlight sliders back up. But again, what you get out of the tool is this, this very malleable um, uh, full total control over all of the tones to the point where you have selective adjustments as well. Right, everything that we've done so far has been global, uh, but you've got this little guy here in the selective adjustments section. They're called control points, uh, and they allow us to selectively control basically any object in the image. You place the point on the object that you want to adjust, uh, size your area, so you see this circle that's going around the control point. You just size that to encompass the entire area that you want to affect. In this case, maybe the clouds. Uh, and then in each control point, you're going to have exposure, contrast, saturation, structure, blacks, whites, temperature, tint, and method strength controls. So these tools basically give you anything that you wanted to do over here on the right-hand side in the tools panel, um, but selectively within the control points. Right, so I can affect these clouds uh, without affecting the building. Or if I drop a control point on the building, I can maybe lighten up the top of the building uh, and then leave the bottom of the building at the current density. Because actually, one thing that will happen in an HDR image, which is usually very unnatural in a natural environment, uh, is that the tops of buildings or trees or anything like that uh, will kind of be, I don't want to say, in, but they'll be darker than the bottom. Right? In fact, if I delete that control point there, you'll notice this, which is probably getting more direct sunlight than down here, uh, is darker than down here. And that's something you want to watch out for, or, or not every time, but uh, to create uh, generally a more natural feel to an HDR image. Um, you typically want the top of the building to be brighter than the bottom of the building. So what these control points allow you to do is that. Right? I can drop the point on the top, brighten it up, I don't have to worry about making any kind of complicated selections um, and maybe even add a little bit of saturation in there so that that matches. Um, and if you ever want to see a selection that a control point is making, you can move over into uh, your selective adjustment section, which is on the right-hand side. And it might be difficult to see right now, but there's a little toggle box over here. If you click on that, it should show you the selection that's being made by the control point. Um, and actually, this control point isn't making uh, the cleanest selection I've ever seen. So I want to make sure that this point affects the top of the building, but not the clouds over here. So what I'll do is just take another control point, place that point in the sky, and you'll notice it starts to clean that up, right? especially as I expand this out. Great. Um, basically, what's happening, and let me turn off the selection. The control point that we placed on the building here is going to look for the similar tone, color, and texture of the object that you place the point on. And that's how it makes its selection. But as you can see, before I placed this control point in the sky, uh, it was affecting the sky a little bit based upon that, you know, what we viewed in the selection. Um, and we didn't want it to, so to clean that up, you place another control point. Because now what's happening is this control is going to control the clouds, the tone, the color, the texture that we placed it on up here. And it's going to sort of communicate with all of the other control points uh, so it knows exactly where it should be affecting in the image. But I can go and add some contrast now and maybe a little saturation to the clouds. And you'll notice it's not going to affect the building. Nice. Does that make sense for those control points? Oh, yeah. It, Dan, it can. I have a question. Um, a common problem with HDR is when we get halos, and I'm starting to notice a little bit just above the, the right-hand side of the building. I, I think that's a bit of a halo, and I wondered, what are your techniques for controlling halos? Uh, so there's, there's different kinds of halos that occur. Um, the, the first one that's the easiest to get rid of typically are sort of chromatic aberration. Um, or fringing halos that occur. 
Uh, usually you can get rid of those within a raw processing tool and you basically just click on a checkbox and it'll fix all of that stuff. Um, if, if you subscribe to not opening a, a raw processing piece of software, there's actually a tool that's built into HDRFX Pro's merge dialog and I can show you that if I move into my history browser uh, which, by the way, this history browser records every single thing that we do while we're within HDRFX Pro 2. You can see it all listed out, which means we can go back uh, to any step or any, any previous state that we've been working on. Um, the other option is this Merge Settings button in the upper left-hand corner. If I click on that, it brings me back to the Merge dialog where uh, you can change the alignment or ghost reduction or uh, this tool right here, which is a chromatic aberration tool which allows you to control those kinds of fringes or halos. Um, now, the, the fringe that, and I'm going to click cancel here because I don't need to change anything. It'll be a bit faster. Uh, the fringe, or, or sorry, the halo that's kind of occurring here might be because of the alignment. It might be because of the clouds up there. Um, if we move up, yeah, and actually you can see a little difference in the noise. So there's a little bit of noise in here. There's no noise in here. What that tells me is it's uh, occurring likely because of, um, you know, the merge using certain information in this area and using different information from up here. So I would say for something like this, we could either go in and change the ghost reduction that we turned on uh, or just because of the noise difference, I would probably do that. Um, or you could drop a control point here on the edge and start to ever slightly, ever so slightly, darken those tones down. And then if you need to, duplicate that control. So usually this can kind of help. Uh, if you just drop very sort of specific and small control points in those areas. Um, at this point, for, for this kind of halo, I actually have another video um, that I, I posted on my Google Plus page. I can make sure you guys have a link to that. Um, on how to get rid of these in Photoshop, which is actually a bit than even doing it here. Uh, but basically, if you wanted to, you just start dropping those control points and you can start to even out the tones. So I'll place one right here, brighten up these values a little bit. And by brightening this area, but darkening down this area, it's going to sort of even that out, or it should start to. Um, I might go with that uh, that video, though, and actually, let me see if I can show you. I don't have it up. Never mind, I closed my page, so I don't currently have it up. I'll make sure you, uh, everyone gets the link to that, but um, it's a, a relatively easy fix for halos and, and fringing that occurs like that. Do you find that adjusting the method strength or, or the HDR method itself um, can also affect halos? Yes, most definitely. So, and that's a great point, Jim. Um, your, your different uh, drama adjustments, as well as your different detail adjustments, which are the tools that, that lie in the tone compression section right in here, um, because they're implementing different tone mapping algorithms, they will actually adjust those, those halos in different ways. So if I were to click on maybe deep, right, you can see it ch kind of changed right in there. If I click on sharp, it's totally different now. Um, in fact, it's kind of been exaggerated. Uh, if I were to click on the flat setting, you wouldn't even see it because now there's little to no contrast being added into those areas. Um, so yeah, and Jim, that's another solution is kind of playing with your uh, drama settings in detail. Um, I, I tend to stay away from those because I, I usually want to... Um, set my drama and detail settings to, you know, whatever looks good or whatever I'm, I'm trying to achieve um, uh, visually and then kind of fixing any little issues like that afterwards. Sure. Um, now, you don't generally have to do that, and it's probably because I'm a glutton for punishment doing that uh, in that way because you could just, again, click on a different button. And another option um, to sort of that aligns with what you're saying, Jim, is... A Uh, I can then control my method strength right in my control point. So I can start to remove any of that HDR method strength, uh, which, which can help as well. Nice. It's not so noticeable. That's a nice feature. All right. Uh, let's see here. So 
actually on this image, let's just take a quick look at the before and after. I'm going to hide this stuff so you get a better view. This is the original merge. Again, my goal really for this image, and I didn't want to even spend this much time on it, I apologize, uh, to, to really take care of those ghost artifacts that were occurring. If I were to zoom in here, you'll see we've got uh, you know several fully formed people. <laughs> so we don't have any of that uh, uh, ghost artifacting occurring. And it's a really important tool uh, to get to know and to be comfortable with when you know, when merging any kind of HDR images uh, with any piece of software, is understanding that, that, that those uh, things that are moving in your exposure series can create those kinds of artifacts. Um, when we're all done editing an image, you simply click the Save button in the lower right-hand corner. It brings you back over into your host piece of software, which now my Lightroom has been minimized. And let's see there. Uh, your, your HDR image is going to be saved in the midst of, should be right next to your uh, original exposure series. But there's your uh, you know, original HDR exposure series and the HDR image itself. Nice. Nice. But it's, it's a very different workflow than um, basically any other HDR piece of software. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice and simple. Uh, but at the same time gives you a whole lot of control that uh, uh, maybe otherwise would be very difficult to achieve within uh, basically any of the other HDR pieces of software, or solutions, I should say. Um, now, the next exposure series, and feel free to stop me, guys, uh, if I'm moving fast or if there's a, you know, a, a, a connection issue or anything like that, because I'll just keep talking. Well, you're, you're doing good, and your re reverb was there, but it's gone again. <laughs> you're doing good enough that I don't have any questions so far. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so what we're looking at right now uh, is an HDR exposure series in, uh, in Adobe Camera Raw, right? And, well, without getting too far into detail, you really don't want to do much, if any, actual adjustments um, to your original RAW files. Uh, I would suggest using lens corrections and adjusting your white balance, uh, but you, you typically want to stay away from doing any sort of luminosity adjustments or contrast adjustments to your exposures before merging them, um, because it can throw off the, the merge itself. Uh, there's, there's a couple schools of thought on that one as well. Um, but uh, I, I tend to subscribe to don't really change much, if anything at all. It's going to give you a much more consistent workflow where you can expect, um, well, you, you kind of know what to expect, I guess. So let's open these. And, and I've actually down res these to 6 megapixels. They're, they're 36 megapixel files. It would take forever if we are going to be editing on those. Um, in fact, it's going to take a minute for these to open anyways. Um, so... I guess with that, I'll, I'll just pull over the Nick Photography page uh, where you can learn a ton more about uh, HDR FX Pro 2, but the rest of the Nick plugins. In fact, we had a tool tip this evening uh, about HDR FX Pro 2, and I'll show you this option. And this is called the Shadow and Highlight Indicator uh, capability or tool, if you will, uh, which actually shows you the areas of your image that are blown out or the areas within your HDR image that are just totally black. So it's a really nice little tip. It's just written up here really quickly. Uh, nice little read. Uh, hopefully Excellent. those images have, have opened up. Dan, I have we need to put the Nick Photography link um, to the page on our um, People to Circle. So we'll put that on there, um, Dan, on our um, circles. Very cool. OK, perfect. That sounds good. Now this is, here's Photoshop still opening the images, and, and I believe there's eight or nine images in this exposure series. Um, and again, if you, if you take a gander at that other demonstration um, that, that Jim was talking about earlier, uh, that they posted on the landscape um, uh, theme page yesterday, uh, that's going to explain, you know, why you might need to shoot nine exposures. Uh, or maybe why you can get away with shooting three exposures, uh, but capturing the full uh, range of information in the, uh, in the situation that you're shooting. So my mouse has disappeared. There we go. And uh, we've got all of eight of our photos. I'm just going to go ahead and move into my Nick Selective tool.
which is uh, one of the ways to access the NIC plugins here from Photoshop. And you really just click the Merge button if you want to merge all of these photos together. But here's where the interface is a little bit different than when we launched from Lightroom or Aperture. Uh, in Lightroom and in Aperture, you have an exposure series within your catalog. You sort of highlight them, and then you right-click, and you export them all at the same time. In Photoshop, because the, the software works in a very different way than a catalog-based a photo editing piece of software, you have this option, or I guess uh, capability built into HDR FX Pro 2, uh, where you have to tell the software what images you want to merge. And what these little buttons say here, this one that my uh, mouse is scrolling over is says open, which allows you to go into a finder and open from, you know, maybe uh, a folder or your desktop. Um, this button right here says add open files which will take any image that's open in Photoshop currently and bring it into the HDRFX Pro 2 merge dialog. You can see mine listed out here. Um, if you have a bunch of images open, and maybe some of them aren't supposed to be merged into your HDR image, uh, but they're open here, that is, you click the Add Open Files button, and they all show up here, what you can do to remove them is simply click on the ones that don't belong and click Remove. Uh, that'll only happen if you have, you know, several images open and some of them don't belong in the, uh, the HDR exposure series. The other major difference between uh, using the software from Photoshop and using the software as a Lightroom or Aperture user is this little checkbox, which allows you to use smart objects, uh, which is great because basically when you're all done editing your image within HDR FX Pro 2 and you save that image, you can open back up and re-edit the photograph in a 32-bit per channel workspace, uh, which means you still have the ability to work with all of the information that's within all of your exposures. It's a nice little extra option. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click it, click it off, um, and I'll show you why later on, if we, as long as we get a little bit more time to, uh, to open the next exposure series. But I'm going to click Merge Dialog. This is going to bring us into where we can control, you know, the alignment, the ghost reduction, and the chromatic aberrations. Um, and it, it, this next window will be uh, familiar um, based upon, you know, the first exposure series that we opened. All right. Takes a second. There's a lot of math that's going on here. In fact, there's, there's sort of... Uh, a couple states, if you will, of, of working in an HDR process. Uh, you know, the first one is you shooting your HDR exposure series. Uh, the next one is, um, you know, merging your HDR exposures together. The, the third would be the tone map of the photo. And actually, for some reason, if I uh, look at this, I must have not uh, had the same lens corrections on. I'm going to turn my alignment off. That didn't fix it. Huh. I must have changed something in my raw process because now you can see uh, I don't have my images lining up properly. So this is an alignment error. I'm not sure what's going on, but let's see if we can fix it. I'm going to turn the ghost reduction on. I don't think that that's actually going to fix because I think it's an alignment error because nothing's actually... Um... Hmm. There we go. Uh, nothing should be really moving here. So I've clicked on my ghost reduction. No, that didn't fix it either. Let me go back into my raw files and make sure I didn't change anything. You know what's funny? I, I <laughs> used these files earlier today to, to make sure that I was kind of ready to go. And for some reason, it worked then. And now it's not working. Yeah, I don't see anything moving. Oh, look at that difference. It's guaranteed gremlins because we're on air. <laughs> well, here's, so it looks like the zoom actually changed between this exposure and that exposure. Oh, my. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and not include that exposure, which should be fine. Um, and, and again, in that other demonstration, we get into, you know, shooting an exposure series and how many stops between each exposure se or exposure uh, we mm -hmm. might suggest. Um, so even though we're getting rid of that one exposure, it, it still should merge just fine. Um, hopefully, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go through this option again, but I'm not including that, uh, that last exposure. Boy, that's funny. 
but not funny, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if this one worked. Hmm. Nope. Look at that. That's so. F I'm going to turn the ghost reduction off. That might help. Still, I've got some kind of error going on. That's wonderful. That provides a great show. <laughs> I well, think I had a similar a, error a <laughs> last reality, time. Reality show. This is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's so funny. Uh, well, you know, I guess I could go in and check my um, check my metadata. Let's see if we were to. Oh, these are PSD files. These are fine to open. I'm assuming that these are all. Let's see. I'm just hoping that nothing is out of whack in my raw process. So what I'm doing now is opening up some 16-bit per channel PSD files. I'm going to try this one more time. If it doesn't work, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll move on to a different exposure series. But that's not a good show at all. <laughs> it's oh, very no, it's reality. <laughs> we, Dan, Dan, we, we can't um, have perfection. Yeah. We, the gremlins are guaranteed. <laughs> They're guaranteed. Let's see here. So you guys have seen this this one window at least three times with the same exposure series. Uh, so you'll be very comfortable with that as you try it out. Uh, now, Kevin, you'd mentioned that you downloaded the uh, the trial. I have did. you gotten a chance to try it out? I've been following along with you, so I'm doing it now. Oh, okay. Very cool. Yes. Have you had alignment issues like this as well? Uh, no. Good. Good to hear. <laughs> so are you connected there in Photoshop or Lightroom, Kevin? Um, I've done both. I did the Lightroom, and now I, well, I actually just closed the one I was working on in Photoshop, but yeah, I, I was doing both. Okay. Cool. Maybe you can show one of them if you finish one in t <laughs> before the show's over. That'd be cool. So yeah, far, see how far I've come, Dan, now uh, that I have Lightroom so I can get the NIC plugins. This is getting expensive as we have all of our guests, oh, but it is helping me with my photography, so I have to thank you. Oh, that's wonderful, and no yeah. problem at all. I, I love coming on to these, uh, these shows whenever I get the opportunity. Um, now, you can see this actually merged properly, so I'm assuming I probably had a lens correction on in one of them and, and not in the full exposure series. So that's probably just totally my user error. I bet you I clicked on something. Um, anyways, I'm going to click Create HDR. This will bring us into HDR FX Pro 2 and you'll get a totally different kind of example um, of, <laughs> of a nice landscape. Uh, now this image is by Josh Haftel. Uh, hopefully, if it opens anyways, right? Uh, and, and Josh is the product manager here at Google for the Nick plugins. Um, I actually worked with him at Nick Software before we moved on to Google. And uh, basically, this, the software, all of them, the whole suite, are, is his baby, if you will. Now, he's, of course, not the only person working on it, but he's kind of the, the lead manager that, that works on this stuff. Uh, he, he's a really great photographer as well, and that's one thing that's really cool about uh, using the NIC plugins. Uh, everybody that uh, is, is working on the NIC plugins uh, has either a photography degree or, um, it, you know, the engineers even are, are avid enthusiast photographers, so that's kind of cool. Um, even our customer support, if you ever call them up or if you write in an email, the entire team has uh, master, not master, sorry, but uh, bachelor's degrees at least in photography. So it's kind of cool just to, uh, to know you're going to get good support uh, from knowledgeable people, not only on the NIC plugins, but in photography as well. All right. So without sounding too pitchy for Nick Software, that probably gets, uh, it sounds like an advertisement, but it is kind of cool that uh, everybody at Nick is, uh, um, is a photographer. Well, we were in the green room, we were talking about the internship, and uh, that's pretty googly, and we're happy for it, though. <laughs> it, really, it really makes sense when you have people who actually know what they're talking about helping you. That is a very good uh, example of how to touch your consumer and really make a meaningful um, impact in their experience. Most definitely, yeah. Definitely helpful. So... 
I, I want to get into just a couple more tools here. I know we, we probably don't have too much time left. Feel free to, to stop me. Um, I, I want to just add a little extra contrast to this image and maybe a little extra detail. Um, one of the tools that we didn't get into is the detailed section or the detailed tools. It allows you to basically exaggerate the, the text and the details uh, by way of the tone mapping. Um, and an interesting way to control this, let's say I turn on my details and it starts to look, you know, that gives you that very HDR look and feel. In fact, I'll even push it further with this dingy drama setting. Um, if I take my method strength slider down to maybe 4 or 5%, I still get that sort of uh, HDR feel, right? But and it's sort of grungy at the same time. But it's a a, a little bit uh, more subtle. So you know, note that when you're using your different HDR methods, all three of these tools are going to be controlled by the overall method strength. Um, and or if you add control points, you can also uh, take your method strength slider down into the negative, and I can remove the uh, HDR method effect from the sky, let's say in this case, and then make sure I put the into, uh, you know, maybe a, a form or building or a tree or anything like that. Right? So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. Those selective capabilities really do offer uh, an extra bit of control. Dan, right. can you show the highlight, the shadow highlight clip tool? Yes, good call, Jim. I mentioned it earlier, but I, I, I didn't show you yet. So in the lower right-hand corner, uh, and again, it's probably difficult to see uh, because of the resolution, but you have a, a loop function and a histogram down there. And in the upper left and right-hand corner of your loop function and histogram, you have two little boxes. The one on the left is the shadow um, clipped capability, and the one on the right is the highlight clipped capability. Um, right now, I don't have a whole lot of contrast, but you can see in these areas where little red bits are showing up, that's blown out, or sorry, that's black, it's just no detail. And then in the middle of the orb of the sun, you can see there's green, yep. and there's there's no detail in there. If I just add some more contrast, it'll be much more noticeable. So I have a question about the highlight one in particular. Will it flag when only one or two of the channels is blown out, or does it require it to actually be white? That's a, it's a good question. Uh, to my knowledge, it will only show up uh, when all three channels are blown out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now that said, you know, well, it it works well as that that sort of indicator. You do want to keep an eye out for uh, your histogram as well. You know, I think these are really great because it kind of shows you the fine detailed areas of of where you're well, losing detail. Uh, but at the same time, you know, keeping an eye on your histogram here is going to be really important. Excellent. Now I went too far here. I made some adjustments I didn't mean to make, so I'm going to go into my history state browser, and I'm going to move back uh, to where we clicked on the balanced preset, and then maybe even move back into our presets and uh, click on a different one really quickly, because it's going to do most of the work for me. Let's go with deep number two here. I'm liking this one. Um, I am losing a little bit of detail in the shadows and within the orb, but I'm okay with having a nice sort of dark black somewhere and uh, something that's a little bit blown out. So, well, not necessarily blown out, but if the if if you have a specular highlight, right, like a street lamp or something like that, uh, it's generally okay <laughs> to have. It's acceptable to have that be uh, blown out sometimes, right? Um, now. I'm going to move into the finishing adjustments. I need to very briefly show you these tools. Uh, you have a vignette capability, right, with presets and the uh, ability to kind of create your own vignette. You have a graduated neutral density tool, which is really interesting uh, because if you've captured all of the information in your exposure series, this will allow you to, um, <clears throat> to create a graduated neutral density filter uh, with all of that information. So it's a lot more like shooting with a grad ND filter than if you were to shoot a single exposure and then try to do that in post-processing, right? Because on a single image exposure, there is the possibility that we don't have all of the information uh, in, the, in the dynamic range of the scene. Uh, you also have a levels and curves capability with a couple presets. You know, there's a couple sort of stylized presets and then uh, some dark contrast, light contrast adjustments. Um, the one that I've clicked on at this point uh, is is basically working with the the 
curve that is pertaining to the uh, preset that we clicked on. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to leave the image just like this. I kind of like what we've got overall, except uh, our monument here is a little bit dark and could probably use a little extra detail. I want to sort of direct your eye as the viewer towards that area, so I'm going to take my exposure up uh, with my control point, a little bit of contrast, and a little bit of structure uh, to get a little detail. Duplicated those points. By the way, to duplicate a control point, you just hold down the Option button. Need this last control point, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it by hitting the Delete key on my keyboard. Uh, I'm going to group these control points, and I'm going to just add one more control point down here so that I don't get that sort of halo um, occurring. I think I've got too much structure still, and at this point we're kind of just being subjective and uh, making some sort of adjustments on the fly. But uh, let's say we really like this and we're all done. Again, all you would do is move into the lower right-hand corner, click the OK button, uh, and you've finished editing your image. But uh, I'd say that's probably time, right, guys? Do we need more? That's for... Excellent. Oh, Dan, that's <laughs> it's been great for for me. You know, coming from not even knowing that it was a plugin on Lightroom to okay, now I might buy it to go with Lightroom. Uh, <laughs> it's been very excellent for me. Thank you. Oh, yeah. wonderful. No problem. I've used it uh, some, but I learned a lot tonight. This was great. But I do have one more question. Hopefully, uh an easy answer? Sure. I generally like to use smart objects. Like you mentioned, it lets me go back later and tweak the adjustments if I want to. Because um, without using smart objects, the changes get baked in as soon as you click OK, right? Yep. Why do you not use smart objects? Good question. So actually, my Photoshop seems to have frozen now. <laughs> um, That's OK. We're looking at Jim. <laughs> oh, OK. So, the uh, let me see if I can even get back to my there we go my hangout so the the using a smart object in Photoshop with the Nick plugin or uh, with HDRFX Pro 2 specifically will keep your image as a 32-bit per channel file um, and and what that means is that you're limited to the different tools that you can use when you're back in Photoshop. Oh, okay. So here, let me. Sorry, there we go. <clears throat> so if if you don't work in the smart object capability, it, it returns you back over into Photoshop with a 16-bit per channel file, which means you have all of those extra capabilities. So you could kind of maybe fine tune or polish the image after um, you know you finish the HDR process. At the same time, theoretically, you could just do the HDR as a smart object. Um, save it out as a 32-bit per channel file, and then, I guess, go into your modes and make it into a 16-bit per channel file afterwards. You'd end up with two different versions of the same HDR image, but then your work is done and it's malleable as a smart object. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dan, uh, for sharing all that. Now we've come to our the part of our show where we um, all share one photographer that will go into a circle of photographers to watch on Google+. And all of our guests are on there, and we will have the Nick um, page. Thank you, Dan. And uh, we'll start with Jim, because we've had Margaret and Tom uh, who come in uh, later, and we'll uh, introduce Introduce you and share your uh, um, your photographer all at the same time. So we'll start with uh, Jim. Okay. So my recommended photographer is Matt Wachowski, um, and he actually has a day job with Google, so it must be Google night tonight. <laughs> he he calls himself a serious amateur. Um, he's based in the Pacific Northwest U.S., uh, Washington State. Um, so let me. And uh, here's an example. He, he really does an eclectic mix of, of images, landscapes, uh, macros. Um, Margaret will be happy to hear that he does birds. Yeah. Um, you know, color and black and white. So uh, 
I'll just show you a couple quick examples. Kind of uh, landscapes, and then here's one of his macros. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think he's, he's uh, good to check out, and uh, I hope you'll follow him. And uh, I think it's a great way to add some variety to your strip. Well, thanks, uh, Jim, and be sure in, in our chat, put his link for me, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. So, Kevin, now it's your turn to uh, tell us who, who to watch. Okay. Okay, the one that I'm going to share is, I'm going to start with someone local, and actually uh, this person just lives in the same city as me. I don't know him, but uh, just through Google+. And his name is Nick Omen, and so he, he does a oh, lot there we of go. Uh, similar okay. stuff with me. Um, this is the Great Salt Lake that he's taking a picture of. Um, black and white. That's the Great Salt Lake as well. And this is a place called Donut Falls that's a real popular Oh, wow. Here. Nice. Very nice. Thank Gorgeous. you, Kevin. You bet. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, <clears throat> I will share my screen with you. And this is, um, let's see. Annalise Cronin from the Netherlands. <clears throat> and um, well, what's happening with my screen share? Why don't we go to Tom? Are you there, Tom? Um, I'm here. Can you, um, do you have somebody that you're going to recommend? Well, actually, I don't. I'm traveling this week and was going to do this with okay. my iPad, and I thought that would probably be beyond my capability. As it turned out, I borrowed a computer. But okay. I, I'm here well, just introduce yourself. Just introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Tom Hurl, and I'm an amateur photographer based in uh, the central coast of California. I'm currently traveling. I'm on the East Coast today, but uh, I'm one of the curators on the theme and have enjoyed working with the group here. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. So now we're going to go to Margaret. Margaret, are, can we can't hear you. If you're muted, if you can unmute you. I think she she did write that she her cable connection was down both the TV and the computer. So you're looking at a screen share of Margaret Tompkins and um, can she you, is can you the hear me now? Originator and yes, founder of the landscape photography theme, and she also does uh, curates a grass um, on Tuesday. I think grass Tuesday. Yes, it's grass Tuesday, grass Tuesday, Tuesday. And she loves birds. So. Um, Carl, now, can you hear I, Margaret? Oh, you can hear Margaret? Mm -hmm. She's here now. Yeah, I think, can, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, I can. Um, it's um, a pleasure to be with you here this evening. I she's apologize. She's through on mine, but oh, hopefully she's... I, I apologize for being late. Um, the entire cable um, thing was out in, in my community, the television, computer, everything. So. Uh, I was pretty much at a loss here, but I do have a photographer to share with you. Let's see if I can. Uh... I, I can't hear her at all, so you guys will have to tell me when she's done. <laughs> she's still she's talking right now. Okay. <clears throat> Well, if it's recording from my side, we're, they're, re they're hearing nothing. Hmm, okay. She's getting her screen share up. Uh, while uh -oh. she's doing that, let me just ask Dan a quick question. Sure. Um, the, the software, the NIC um, software, that is, a, is the HDR uh, effects in that bundle? Yeah. So that's uh, $150, is that right? Yep, so it's $149 for the whole suite comes with all six of the individual pieces of software that uh, plug into Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture. Okay, that's a really good deal. 
Are you seeing a photograph? Well, I think now? before uh, it was um, a lot more expensive, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah but and it used so to be five hundred dollars for the whole suite. Yes. And Google dropped the price um, a couple months ago to one forty nine. So. Tremendous. Great. So, <laughs> well, here we are with some more gremlins, and uh, my okay. screen here won't <clears throat> won't come up at all. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about Annelise uh, Cronin. She is from the Netherlands, and um, she is also <clears throat> a curator for Nautical Wednesday and Four Wheel Friday. So uh, she will be in the circle, and you'll have to just go there and uh, check out her um, her page so that you can see her beautiful work. And Annelise, I'm sure, sorry, but. Uh, We'll get you in that circle. And now, Dan, do you have somebody you would like to share with us? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, let me go ahead and switch to my screen share. Uh, this one. Okay. So uh, this is he's, his name's Todd Sipes. Uh, he he lives in Marin Marin County, which is just north of San Francisco here. And he's uh, I thought appropriate for this talk. He shoots uh, a good amount of HDR, but he's an urban explorer. So he's he's always finding sort of new, well, not new, obviously new, old, interesting environments. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think this is an HDR in terms of a, an HDR exposure series, but uh, a definitely a, a really cool photo of something. I'm assuming uh, they're they're on a boat or he was on some kind of boat uh, by his, his label here. It says all aboard, but <clears throat> definitely a good guy to watch. Uh, he's always got really cool content. Uh, he's hilarious and uh, has a, a unique style to him, uh, which I, I've really quite enjoyed. Um, and he's, he's included me on a couple of their urban explorer trips, so I appreciate that. Um, and I can't make anything that's even close to something like this. He definitely has uh, a unique eye for shooting this kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Nice. That's awesome. Great. Do we want to okay. try, try Margaret again? Okay. Uh, Margaret, we're back um, to you. Yeah, Car. I'm sorry you can't uh, hear me. I take it the yeah, others can hear me. Yeah, I can't hear, hear you. And uh, click on your camera. So, um, Kevin, did you get yours up? Yeah, I shared mine. Okay. All right. Do you want to put your? Um, oh, that's right. Uh, put your uh, over there on the side. There we go. So thanks, Dan. And um, so we're going to say goodbye then, we, everybody. It's been delightful, Dan. Thank you for coming back, showing us the Google Knit products. It's um, it's so fun to see where you can go uh, with your photography with just some specific help and uh, you do a lot on your YouTube channel where you've got extra tips and on your page so we'll be delighted to uh, be following you and uh, so I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come and watch this evening watch for our summary of episode 12 of landscape photography we'll have all of our uh, photographers circled for you uh, in a new circle that will come out to watch and and you have a great week, and we will see you in two weeks. <laughs> Thank you.